Thank you. you. May be seated. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace. What an incredible, wonderful thought as we look into the Word of God and see the grace of God, even in Egypt. Grace, they should have all died, including the children of Israel. <laughs> but God in His mercy spared some, didn't He? Just like God in His mercy has spared us. What a marvelous, wonderful act of grace that God has given to us. And that while we were yet sinners, not while we were good, but while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We'll wait for just a minute for Paul to find a seat. I encourage you all to be on time. He's not the only one. Okay, in your bulletin, there are some inserts, important inserts. Number one, you have a little teeny-weeny slip of paper that gives you the budak. Keith was talking about mnemonic devices, but uh, budak is easier to remember than mnemonic, okay, with an M and an N at the beginning of it. The ten plagues of Egypt, blood, frogs, lice, flies, murrain, that's cattle plague, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, death of firstborn, so blood, blow, frogs, fro, lie, lice, Fly, fly. Murrain, cattle, plague. What in the world do we always say since it's for cattle? It's moo. Moo. Boils, bow. Hay for halo. Uh, for hail. <laughs> yeah, halo. Halo is the, is the uh, budak. Hail is the plague. Locust, that's the low part. Da for the first two letters of darkness and D for death of the firstborn. If anybody doesn't pass this test, <laughs> you are in serious trouble, okay? That was the first of the uh, budaks that you got today. And then the second one is you have life, liberty, and love. And it's up here someplace, which I will wave around in a second. Here it is. Uh, this is part two. Now, several weeks ago, I put part one in the bulletin. I hope you got that one. If you didn't, I've put extra copies of both parts, both part one and part two, on the little table right outside the door here because it's... You know, what do Christians do? Because so many Christians disagree with each other on what things are permitted and what things are not permitted in the Christian life. These two inserts are designed to help you develop a, a schematic, a framework, for how to make decisions as to whether or not this is something that ought to be doing in the Christian life. So please, pick a, if you didn't get one, or if you threw it away, or if you didn't read it, please pick up another copy of Part 1 and read it, and then read Part 2 very very useful I think for you the third insert today is lots of inserts is a message outline sheet now I did not give you point by point everything that I'm going to say today because as you saw just a moment ago the Lord gave me more insight into verse 21 where Moses called for all the elders of Israel and I, I've just always said well everybody went out and did this you know not ever paying attention to the fact that he talked only to the elders and he told them to do it they communicated with the rest of the people. So there's some responsibility there with, with the elders communicating. But the elders set the example. Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And he told them exactly what to do in verse 22. And then it got spread and communicated, but it was the elders to whom he spoke first. But anyway, so you've got your uh, sermon notes. So that's why I don't give you an outline of everything that I'm going to say. Because sometimes the Lord changes my message right in the middle of the message like he did just now. <laughs> so, uh, But you've got no excuse other than you can say, I don't have a pen. Listen, if you really need a pen, I will let you walk out there. Some over here on that table. There's some up here in this basket. If you need a pen or a pencil, please get one if you're going to take notes. It's there. You've got the date. You've got the text. And you can see the text right here. Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 through 28. You know who the speaker is. You can write it in, but I made it blank because sometimes we have guest speakers. You know what the title of the message is, although today, since I am actually going to continue from last week, we are not going to talk about dead meat everywhere just yet. And we won't talk about dead meat everywhere on Valentine's Day either. <laughs> In fact, I won't even review next week uh, what Valentine's Day is going to have a very special message, and I hope it will be a blessing to you, but you can write in the message title. So you can just write in the message title from last week and put part three. Pass it on. Child training, part three. And the text is the same. Exodus chapter three. And then you also have a couple of other things in your bulletin as well. Uh, you've got marriage encounter flyer. Now, 
folks, encourage you to be here. You know, I, I was able to stream and broadcast that um, DVD that we showed, 180 degrees. Uh, that that is uh, freely available for streaming over the internet. I paid personally for the license to show this film next Sunday evening, uh, but I can't get a license to stream that one. So if you want to see it, you have to be here. Uh, you can't say, uh, "Oh well, I'll just watch," you know, on the internet next week. You have to be here to actually be able to see this one. So um, I encourage you to do that. And I've printed up a bunch of extras of these. Some of you have access to grocery store bulletin boards and library bulletin boards and places like that. Uh, I have. Uh, actually sent information about this to I think seven or eight different media outlets. Um, we're hoping to have a lot of people here. I mean, who knows? Only God can draw people here. But it's really sort of funny when there are more visitors than there are regular members of the church at any particular event. So um, please put these things up wherever you can. There are extra copies on the table outside and we uh, want to encourage you to be involved in the outreach of this church, not just the preacher but having all the people involved in the outreach of the church as well. So uh, four things. The Ten Plagues Budak Sheet, The Life, Liberty, and Love, Part 2, Message Outline Sheet, Marriage Encounter Flyer. Please pass them out. Please be sure to be here. You know I don't give advertisements very often. Those of you who listen to National Public Radio know that they're having their quiet fun drive right now. Uh, usually they have ten days where they hammer at you for hour after hour about how you need to send money if you want to keep the music going because if you don't send the money in they're going to keep talking <laughs> and they're doing a quiet one now they just mention it every now and then and they've already reached over hundred and sixty thousand dollars of the three hundred thousand dollars that they're trying to raise um, wish we could do that here you know I just sort of mentioned every now and then and suddenly you know people start giving um, I know you give but um, I'm giving you advertisements today yes because I really want you to be here next week. How should a man love a woman, and how should a woman love a man? I'm going to be sharing some of the things that I prayed for in a wife before I met Judy, and some of the things that she prayed for in a husband before she met me. If you're single, I'll be sharing how to pray for a life partner. If you're married, I'll be sharing what you should be praying for your husband or wife. If you're widowed or divorced, I will be sharing with how you should be praying in relation to that issue and everybody else in the church. It's an important message. Please be here. I've been working on this for months at this point. Some of you wondered, you know, was it preacher dude just whip everything together at the last moment? I've been working on this particular message for months, and I think God has given me some very exciting things to share with you out of Scripture. So please be here for that message. And then the evening film marriage retreat. Um, yeah, we, we encourage you to be here. It's, it's a humorous film. Three couples uh, going on a marriage retreat. All three couples having major kinds of problems that normal couples usually have. And how God resolves those through His Word in the end. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. So be here for that as well. Now, we're talking about child training. Uh, pass it on, part three. We've seen how Paul... Let me get rid of some of this extra paper that's all scattered all over here. How the Apostle Paul has cited the Passover in the Exodus narratives and how he tied eight key doctrines together in Romans 11 that stem from Christ fulfilling the typology of the Passover lamb. And those were obvious doctrines we need to pass on to our children. Just mention them for you again. Remnant principle, judgmental blindness, chastening and loss of rewards, eternal security, restoration of seeing, blessing for repentance, guaranteed future in the land of promise for national Israel, the permanent nature of the covenants of God, and the spiritual gifts and the grace of God. We talked about how God uses Satan to chasten not only pagans, but also believers, and we need to teach that to our children. We saw many passages that show that chastening is a manifestation of grace. And when we discipline our children, and it's required by God, we need to teach them the theology of grace, that there's a kind and loving and wise side, a wonderful side to chastening as well, because chastening proves love. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And heavenly fathers are supposed to be, our earthly fathers are supposed to reflect their heavenly father in applying the rod to their children. Otherwise, they'll come under judgmental blindness. We studied that in great detail. We also saw how a true believer, even a hero of faith like Samson, can reach a point of no return because he walked in the flesh and he refused to do what he knew was right. And so God took away five things from him his freedom, his honor, his sight, his position of authority as a judge of Israel. His, ultimately, it cost him his life. We saw that God judges believers severely, even those who are heroes of faith. 
Have you taught that lesson to your children and grandchildren? Have you passed it on? We've seen some things in those lessons from the ten uh, plagues in Egypt. In the text that we had before us today, Moses was telling them to remember the setting for Passover, which was darkness, judgmental blindness, and the blindness followed by death because they indulged in what we've talked about as the seven deadly sins. And, of course, I covered the seven deadly sins quite a while ago. Now, something very exciting. You know, I want to say thank you to the elders, uh, and I mean that sincerely. Because last week I reported to you that I've had recent complaints from the elders that my teaching is not clear enough. Well, you know, that really, at first, that really depressed me. Uh, and uh, number two, it really irritated me. But then I thought, Lord, you put that in my life. You gave these guys to tell me that for a reason. So please show me what is the reason. Uh, I mean, there must be something for me to learn out of this. And I'm happy to report to you, yes, I did. And what I learned was, you were all wrong. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> now, I learned, I learned some, some great things that I'd like to share with you. Um, it got me thinking about the big question, why has the complaint been raised? And as I was meditating on that and going over different passages of Scripture, uh, I realized it had a perfect tie-in with the topic of our message, which I changed from what's in your bulletin. Pass it on, child training, part three. In fact, I got so excited about it that I printed up the outline sheets that you see and put them in your bulletins today so that nobody can say that they wish they had something to write on. So uh, anyway, there it is. Um, and yeah, I actually, you know, I didn't ever want to do that. You know, it's way too much work for me to actually have to do outlines every week. But at least this gives you something to write on. So uh, let me share with you some biblical insights that I got while I was meditating on the question, why don't they understand? Am I really not clear? So the obvious first reason that people don't understand, which is the complaint that the elders uh, gave to me from some of you, is that I really am not clear. <laughs> yeah, i got to admit that. It's, uh, yeah, if I, I'm really not clear sometimes. If that's the case, then certainly the blame falls squarely at my feet. For example, what if my messages to you sounded like this? An oppression claim would seem to conflict directly with this subsection of the statute. Moreover, the Alabama Supreme Court re previously held in Hines that the duty of good faith and fair dealing set out in Alabama Code Section 110A-5-3.03H dash dash did not, standing alone, create a, cl uh, a claim for minority oppression in the LLC context. Proponents arguing for a cause of action for minority oppression in the LLCs, therefore, will find little help in the plain language of the ALLCL and will find no additional assistance in the new ALLCL of 2014. The leading treatise on oppression, O'Neill and Thompson Oppression of Minority Shareholders and LLC Members, sums up the dilemma faced by minority owners of LLCs and other small businesses. <laughs> Ooh. No if I pre precisely <laughs> my point. <laughs> Ooh, would anybody come to church here if that was what I was doing? I don't think so. Now, that's a quotation. I understand it. That's a quotation directly from a very interesting article. It is a very interesting article in the January edition, 2016, of the Alabama Lawyer, a periodical that I subscribe to, and I read it regularly. You know, I read a lot of stuff you guys don't read, and you would probably never want to read, okay? The reason that most of you don't understand that, and perhaps even thought that it was talking about racial discrimination, because I was talking about the oppression claims and things like that. Ooh, is that the racial discrimination? Maybe you thought about racial discrimination. It's a lack of education. You haven't been to law school. You don't deal with limited liability corporations. That's what an LLC is, by the way. Small corporations, C corporations, the many and various types of nonprofit corporations, foundations, sole proprietorships, and other business entities. You just don't walk in that world or swim in that pool. So obviously you're not educated on that and that would be ridiculous for me to talk to that to you about those things. The problem, lack of education in the subject matter. If I wanted to talk to you like that, I would have to first educate you. That's the element of teaching that we discussed in that three-legged stool illustration that I gave last week for child training, the three-legged foundational areas of passing it on to our children and grandchildren. Number one was teaching, that's the first leg. Second leg is discipline, that's the second leg. Third leg is example, that's the three-legged stool. If you remove any one of those lessons, you will not successfully train your children in the fear of the Lord. So then I examined the content of my messages. Spent quite a bit of time thinking about this one. 
and concluded that the, in the majority of messages that I bring, listen carefully, in the majority of the messages that I bring, between one half and two thirds of the messages are actually quotations of and citations of Bible verses. You know that I read lots of Bible verses when I'm giving my messages. Normally less than one half of the message is my personal views. Normally the naked scripture should be enough because the Bible says the entrance of thy words giveth light. The exhortation from the elders was these people have a strong foundation in the Bible and many years of Bible teaching but you are not clear. So then the question becomes why don't they understand what the Bible is saying? I examined myself. You know, I appreciate being able to examine myself every now and then. I hope you guys do that every now and then. Don't just always look outside to see what the problem is. Let's, each of us, and I did this this last week. I went through a, a time of really um, almost depression. But I said, Lord, there's a reason that you put this in my life. Let me examine myself to see where the problem lies. And so I'm telling you these things honestly and openly this morning. You may hate me for it. Uh, you may say he still is a nut, he's a fruitcake. But um, I spent quite a bit of time thinking about this this past week. So the question becomes, why don't they understand what the Bible is saying? I examined myself to see if I had not included enough verses to make each point. That was obviously not the problem. I got an overwhelming amount of flood of verses on all the messages. I examined myself to see if the verses were irrelevant to the points that I was trying to make. That's not the problem. I examined myself to see if I had presented the verses in a disorganized manner. You know, sort of a sloppy chaos. Nobody will understand sloppy chaos. No. I can honestly say that I've carefully researched, cataloged, organized, and set forth the appropriate verses. Then I looked at Jesus. You know, folks, and I think nobody would disagree with this statement, Jesus was the greatest teacher that ever lived. If you disagree with that, please raise your hand. I'd really like to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> We all agree, don't we? Nobody could ever say that he was not clear. He quoted a lot of verses out of the Old Testament to make his points. If you've ever read the Gospels, you know that. And you know from my preaching that even something you might have missed, I say, do you remember this is actually over in Habakkuk, or this is over in Isaiah, or this is over in such and such a place? You know, he quoted verses, a lot of them, even though he could have actually spoken original, inspired scripture. Everything that Jesus said is inspired scripture. He could have made it up as he went along, and it would have been inspired, because Jesus is God. But for our sakes, he quoted a lot of scripture so that we might know his position on the scripture. But I was surprised to really notice for the first time how many times people didn't understand him, even though he was clear. People who thought he wasn't clear. I'm just going to give you a couple of these. I'm not going to overwhelm you with this, but I mean, as I was going through the Gospels and thinking about this issue, it is amazing how many times people didn't get it. And it was Jesus talking. Think about that. He's been talking about whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood. We're going to be taking, partaking of the Lord's table this morning. So it's a good tie-in. Uh, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, you know, has life. And if you don't, you can't maybe pardon me and so on like this. And then it says in verse 52, John chapter 6, The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Do you think they understood what Jesus was talking about? <laughs> I don't think so. They didn't get it. They had no idea what Jesus was talking about. Even the disciples didn't really get it. We go down to verse 59. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So these were not just ordinary secular Jews that were running around. Now, these were people who went to synagogue. 
or we would say today, went to church. People who had heard it read over and 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 over again, week after week after week, who thought they knew a lot of what the Bible meant as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples. Now look, these are the people who follow Jesus closely. They follow his his blogs on Facebook, okay? Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? The disciples didn't get it. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Hmm. Even the disciples got offended at what Jesus taught. We're going to be talking about that particular principle later on, so we won't cover it right now. What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Now, what in the world does the ascension have to do with what Jesus just said? Well, some well, you've heard me. I preached through this in the Gospel of John a couple of years ago. I preached the whole Gospel of John. It is a, I hope you remember it. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words, ah, here's the key. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. We're going to talk about that principle in just a second. But there are some of you that believe not. Mm, that's another of the very key principles which the Apostle Paul expounds on theologically in the New Testament. There are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto the Father except it were given unto him of my Father. That's another of the principles as to why some understand and why some don't understand. We'll be talking about that in a moment. Now look at verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Rather than believing, rather than accepting his explanation and understanding, which they could have done, they decided we're through. We're not going to have any more of Jesus. We say, we would never have done that. Oh, really? Be careful. How about Matthew 13, 53? And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not this his mother Mary? And his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, which, by the way, belies the fact that Mary was a perpetual virgin, Roman Catholic doctrine. And his sisters are not all they with us? So at least seven in the family. Sisters is plural, so at least two sisters, plus the four brothers, plus Jesus. Whence then hath this man all these things? Here's another one of the problems why people don't understand Scripture. They're focused on the wrong things and therefore they don't understand. They've got a temporal focus. They've got a this world focus. And listen, verse 57, next verse. And they were offended in him. They didn't understand him. They were offended in him. They didn't like what he said. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And you know what? Not much happened because of that. And what is the reason? Verse 58. He did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. The issue was not that Jesus wasn't clear. The issue was they were expecting something else and they didn't believe and Jesus says to the disciples he answered and said unto them because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to them it is not given again we have a, another of the principles why people don't understand we're dealing with the sovereignty of God and who God will let understand and who he won't and there are reasons why he lets you understand and reasons why he doesn't let you understand now we're going to talk some more about those reasons why Jesus was not clear in just a little bit. The problem was not with Jesus, but the problem was with the listeners. And by the way, this is a two-part message. You're only going to get half of it today because, of course, we have the Lord's table. We have to move along here. But let's look at a few obvious reasons that people don't understand. 
Number one, some have physical handicaps. They are blind or they are deaf. Now, I'm just trying to learn right now how to use Facebook, and I'm pretty stupid when it comes to Facebook. I mean, I can find things one time, and I can't find them the next time. And when I turn it on, there's this page, which is the bottom of this page. The first time I turned it on, I thought, oh, let's see down at the bottom. And I kept going down and going down and going down and going down and going down. I mean, it was humongous. I had no idea. I thought, I don't even know some of these people. How did they get on my Facebook page? You know, I never even heard of them before. Oh, well, yeah, you know, I'm a. When it comes to uh, things like that, I'm an idiot. But uh, but there was um, one very interesting old movie, black and white, which was of Helen Keller and Anne Sullivan, as she was explaining how Anne learned to talk, blind and dumb and how she put her fingers on her lips and on her larynx and soon learned through the vibrations that she could feel to make certain sounds. That's dedication both in teacher and student there. So we understand that some people can't understand because they have physical handicaps. And by the way, I'm very glad that whatever... I know how those things get up there. I mean, I have absolutely no idea how all this stuff gets up there. But I'm so glad that one did just like a day or two ago because it gave me an illustration for this sermon today. Do you understand the sovereignty of God in things? Nothing happens apart from His sovereign will. Even such a minor thing as an idiot pastor who doesn't know how to use Facebook, finding an illustration... Dear people, we have an incredible God. Anyway, second reason that some people, an obvious reason that people don't understand, some people have mental handicaps. They cannot intellectually grasp what is being said. Some people have language difficulties. They don't speak the English language, and I preach in English. Suppose I said a phrase in Spanish, there would be two people here probably who understand it. Maybe more. Buenos dias, amigos. Y lo invitamos a pavillon alive. Programas presentados en este pavillon son bilingües, inglés y español. You understood that, Sylvia? Yeah, yeah, she understood it. Maybe you're right. <laughs> you know, okay. <laughs> okay. I don't preach to you in Spanish. I preach in English. I think most of you speak English, but, but there are people who don't speak English. Just like Jesus and Paul preached in Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek. And so you definitely could not have understood what they said. You could have definitely said that they were not clear to you if you heard them preach. But that problem isn't with Jesus or Paul preaching in those three different languages. Another obvious one is some have cultural difficulties and don't understand the idioms that you use. So trying to speak cross-culturally, even when both people speak the same language, like in Texas, you know they speak English? Now, I know most people don't think they speak English in Texas. <laughs> I came from Texas. I do speak English. Uh, but there's a difference in culture. For example, if I were to say unto you, rustle me up some calf fries, now you'd understand every one of those words, but most of you would have no idea what I was talking about. Those of you who've lived in Texas would understand, or those of you who've had enough contact with a Texan. Now, let's look at a couple of biblical reasons, and our time is running, why people don't understand. And I'm going to spend a little more time on these next week with some other biblical reasons, but I'll try to give you at least three. Number one, the reason that some people don't understand according to Scripture is the suppression of the truth. Romans 1, beginning in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That word hold is a wrestling term. It means to tie up your opponent and hold him down, suppress him. One reason some people don't understand is because they suppress the truth that they know is there and they don't want either themselves or anyone else to hear it or understand it. 
Paul goes on, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. If you're suppressing the truth, don't blame the Bible, don't blame the preacher, don't blame the commentaries. If you're suppressing the truth, you are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. That's back to judgmental blindness, back what we've talked about already in our text. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And of course, the context here, suppressing the light of creation. Romans 1 is light of creation. Romans 2 is light of conscience. Romans 3 is light of scripture. People suppress in all three of those areas. The evolutionists do it, of course, in the area of creation. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The second reason that people don't understand when they hear the word of God proclaimed is because they're not saved. Paul says so. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches. And you can get plenty of that if you look on television. All the psychological garbage that is being pumped out there as gospel truth, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Hmm, spiritual things, and it's actually spiritual ones. Interesting gender change there. We'll talk about it sometime. But the natural man, now listen, here's a person called the natural man. This is the unsaved man. He functions according to his old nature. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know him. It's impossible. It's like light shining on a rock. It doesn't give you know any kind of insight to the inside of the rock. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. An unsaved man not only doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God, he can't understand them. I hope as we're going through these lists of different reasons from Scripture that you begin to say to yourself, do I fit this category or do I fit this category? And that's the reason I don't understand. Why, the preacher isn't clear to me. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we that is the spiritual man, the one who is the saved man, but we have the mind of Christ. But he doesn't stop there. The very next verse is chapter 3. The next kind of person, the third kind here, a person who doesn't understand when the scripture is preached. And remember, Jesus had these kinds of people in his audiences and everything he spoke was scripture both what he said personally and when he quoted the Old Testament and they didn't understand some because they suppressed the truth like the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees some because they weren't saved some because they were quite carnal and that's the third category beginning in verse 1 and I brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual but as unto carnal even as unto babes in Christ. Spiritual are those who have grown up spiritually. We all like to think of ourselves that way. But he says, some of you are fleshly. You are saved, but you're living like the natural man. You're saved, but the reason you don't understand is because you're walking in the flesh. Oh, you're alive, you're a babe, even as unto babes in Christ. You're in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? It's the third reason. It's not the only place that Paul writes it. He writes it also to the Hebrews. He's been telling them about Melchizedek, and he's going to spend basically two chapters on that, chapter 6 and 7. But he says about that before he gets into it, Hebrews 5, 11, 
of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, not because we can't find words, he says, seeing that ye are dull of hearing. For when, for the time, ye ought to be teachers, in other words, you've been Christians long enough, Paul says to the Hebrews, that you should be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Did you know you can atrophy? You can read a point of spiritual maturity, and you can atrophy, just like your muscles. Uh, you can, you know, I've had that happen to me. I used to be an athlete, actually quite a good athlete, when I was in high school and in college. I won all kinds of awards in high school, cross country, wrestling, track. In college, I set lots of records in college, in track, in cross country. But you know what? I can no longer even closely approach a four minute mile. I was close, I never broke it. But I actually got very close in my senior year of high school. But you know what? My muscles have atrophied. Because I haven't kept exercising like I should have kept exercising. Did you know that can happen to you as a Christian? You think, ah, oh, I've reached the plateau of great spiritual maturity and wisdom. Did you know if you don't keep exercising, your spiritual muscles, through a consistent persistent, I will not be interrupted kind of an attitude, a focused attitude where you're memorizing scripture and doing it regularly and consistently and persistently and let nothing stand in the way of it, where you're meditating on scripture. I had a couple of days this week where I didn't actually come over to the office over here for four hours in the morning because I was in prayer and studying scripture and writing notes in the margins of my Bible not to prepare for this message but because I need it if I'm going to pass it on to you I have to have it myself and you parents you have to do that yourself if you want to pass it to your kids husbands if you want to pass it to your wives you got to do that and that for you as husbands that is your obligation The family is the microcosm of what the church is supposed to be like. What are you building into your life? Do you have responsibility for younger people? Are you a teacher in school? Are you, are you some kind of a leader somewhere? Do you have responsibility for others? Are you every day spending enough time in the Word so that you can show it in your life? you got contact with people that this preacher doesn't have contact with and you got it on a regular basis and you have it on an intense basis are you focused on scripture because you have people who are looking up to you or have you atrophied now I can still walk five miles but I can't run five miles I can still get from here to there but it takes me a lot longer to do it atrophy when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk, I don't understand that. I just want milk. Give me the easy stuff. Lay it out for me. Type it up. Give it to me so I can stick it in my Bible and never look at it again. It is unskillful. Now listen, not just in the word. In the word of righteousness. What you believe changes what you do. What you believe changes what you do. You know my question. You say you're a Christian. So how has it changed your life? He's unskillful in the word of righteousness. That is faith put into shoe leather. For he is a babe. 
You pride yourself in your spiritual maturity? Have you atrophied? But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use... Did you get that? Three little letters. U-S-E. Not by reason of knowledge. Not by reason of, well, it's back there someplace in my memory. It's the practical application of doctrine who by reason of use have their senses exercised. That's where you atrophy if you do not exercise. To discern. How little discernment the churches of America have today. To discern both good and evil. Well, there's a lot more. A lot more reasons why people don't understand. But at least I hope you got three of them. Did you catch those? I mean, all the common obvious ones, like people, somebody who's blind and deaf, obviously going to have a harder time understanding. Won't be clear to them. Somebody who doesn't speak English won't be clear to them. Somebody who doesn't understand the cultural idioms won't be clear to them. Those are all obvious things. But the first of the really biblical ones those who suppress the truth. They don't want to hear it. And boy, Jesus' critics were like that. And they don't want anybody else to hear it. That's number one. Number two, not saved. Do you know for sure you're saved? If you don't understand Scripture when it's read, and yes, I know there are difficult passages because there are different levels of spiritual growth. But if you never understand anything, are you saved? Paul says, examine yourself, see whether you be in the faith or whether you're reprobate. Examine yourself, not everybody else. Examine yourself. Number three, are you carnal? Do not understand because you're walking in the flesh. And that can be because you've chosen never to grow or because you're a brand new believer, though some brand new believers grow faster than you can imagine. Or maybe you've atrophied. You've been a Christian for so long that you sat back on your heels and just thought, hmm, good enough for government work. Hey, everything is cool and I'm moving right along. It's okay. Pleasant. I hope that was a clear message. Anybody who didn't understand it, please talk to me afterwards. Because if I'm not clear, come to the source. And I'll try to make it clear. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Every now and then, Father, we have to be brought up short. And I thank you that you did that with me this past week. And Father, I'm sure that there are many times when I've been a, a jumbled mess and not clear, though you know my deep heart desire in caring for your sheep, not mine, but yours, is to feed them, to give them good food, to give them your word, to let them hear the words of Scripture, not just my words. Father, cause them to understand and grow and abound in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For I love your people. I love them here. Give them your blessing. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If I can find my bulletin, which got stuck underneath here. Um, let's turn to number 413. Break thou the bread of life. We'll sing only the first and fourth verses of hymn 413. We'll stand to sing, and then we will have the Lord's table. Hymn number 413.
please remain standing. It is our custom here to recite together the Apostles' Creed before we partake of the Lord's Table. It's at the bottom of the first page of your bulletin and the top of the second page. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, reminds them of the reasons that we partake of the Lord's table. He was not there the night, of course, in which our Lord Jesus Christ instituted this ordinance, which we remember him by periodically, but he did receive special revelation concerning it. Beginning in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now this I declare unto you, and praise you not, that you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that's the word for divisions, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, unto one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating every one taketh before another his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. What have ye not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them which have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Paul scolded them at Corinth too. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Say, Paul, was there more than that? Apparently so. Whenever we partake of the Lord's table, we're reminded, especially from this passage, that this is the Lord's table. It doesn't belong to this church alone or to Bible Presbyterians in general, and everybody else is excluded. It belongs to Christ. It belongs 
to those to whom he has given it, that is, to those who believe on him, his disciples. If you're visiting with us today and you've made a true acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, you've trusted him alone for your salvation, you're welcome at this table because it is his table, not ours. But there are some warning passages in this text. It's not written to the unbelievers, it's written to believers. Unbelievers should understand that there is no magic in these elements over here. You cannot get saved by eating the bread and drinking the juice. It will only condemn you. Because you've rejected the one of whom these symbols speak. If you've never trusted Christ, trust him now. But for those who are believers, Paul said, some of you are coming to the Lord's table and you're not coming prepared. You know, that's why we hold a preparatory service on Friday evening. So that we might be reminded of our sins and of the necessity of confession and of genuine repentance, turning from them, of making things right, leaving our gift at the altar and going our way and finding our brother whom we have offended and making it right with him where we have sinned against someone else before we come and give our gift to the Lord. I hope that if there was someone against whom you sinned, that you've made it right before coming today. I hope your heart is prepared because there they came to take the Lord's table with unclean hands and unprepared hearts. And as a result, some of them got very sick. And some of them died. We've talked about the sin unto death. Different from the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. But they'd committed the sin unto death. Your people, God is serious. Just like he was serious with Israel at the Passover. And people who didn't do what they were told died. That's serious. God is not playing games. Some of you are sick. And some of you, not just some, did you know Look at verse 30. For this cause, many of you are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. They had a plague of death at Corinth. Not a few. It says many. For if we would judge ourselves, you don't need to sit around and judge somebody else sitting next to you or wonder why that person is taking the Lord's table or saying, you know, I don't like the pastor. You know, he's too blunt. If we would judge ourselves, ourselves, that means I have to judge me. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And then what we've been talking about for weeks but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Do you understand why the Lord's table is so serious? Don't try to stuff it. Don't try to hide your sin. The book of Proverbs tells you that whoso covereth his sin shall not prosper, but he that confesseth and forsaketh it shall have mercy. Is there sin in your life? Sins of thought, sins of words, sins of deeds, sins of motives, sins of attitudes. Have you confessed it? Have you repented of it? Make sure you do before you come to the Lord's table. I know there are some people who never take the Lord's table because they're afraid there's something that they haven't confessed. Did you know that's willful sin? That's disobedience. 
Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. The way to solve the problem is not to avoid the Lord's table. The way to solve the problem is to deal with the sin. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the bread which reminds us of the beautiful body of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lamb without spot or blemish, verily foreordained before the foundation of the world. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The spotless Lamb, the pure Lamb, the innocent Lamb, the Passover Lamb. Father, how we thank you that he died in our place and that his blood has been sprinkled over the lintel and the doorposts of our houses. And Father, as we feast on him, oh, these are but elements to remind us of him, but our real feast is on Jesus. There's no transubstantiation. There's no consubstantiation. It's a memorial. Do this in memory of me. Oh, Lord. How easy it is to be sidetracked by false doctrine. Help us, Father, to see Jesus as we partake of the elements that remember him. And, Father, help us to want to be like him. Because someday we will see Jesus as he is. What a blessing. So, Father, we thank you for this bread that you have given to us, that our Lord has given to us, and told us, do this in remembrance of me. In Jesus' name, amen. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon a Cyrenian coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. We thank you, Father, for this memorial of the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who bore our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. This do in remembrance of me. Our gracious Father, we thank you also for the cup, the beautiful picture of the blood of Jesus Christ, shed for the remission of sins, 
for without the shedding of blood there is no remission. How we thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, cleanses from all sin. How we thank you, Father, that Jesus shed his blood for us. Oh, Father, the blood of Jesus Christ, his life, he gave because he loves us. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. How we thank you for the blood of the sacrifice. Thousands of lambs, millions of lambs perhaps, have died as a picture of Jesus, shedding their blood pouring out their blood, but the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. But this man, once when he had offered himself as a sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And it's from there that he ever lives to make intercession for us who are his children. Those who have been bought with the blood of the Lamb. Father, how we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, and for this memorial. In Jesus' name, amen.